and then we'll pick up one section after the other and keep on studying the amendments. That uh, the that sheet that you have, the first part itself, is the tax rate of our discussion. Now, how does an individual calculate this tax? Yeah. Uh, companies? Partnership form? What is the tax rate for a domestic company? So, November 19, reproduce I'll modify it to 820. 25% or 25 or 25 or 25 or 25 or 25 the turnover of the company two years ago was 250 crores or less, then the tax rate for the company today will be 25%. Else it will be 30%. 30 Partnership firm, 30%. Uh, senior citizen, what is that rate? Senior citizen. I mean, somebody who is 60 or above, but less than 80, the basic exemption limit of 3 lakhs, who was that rate? Super senior citizen? Perfect. And everybody else? Slab rates have not changed. Slab rates have not changed. But the first change that has happened for individuals is that rebate has increased. What was the provision of rebate? It was allowed to resident individuals if the total income was less than equal to 350,000. Then the maximum rebate allowed was that 350,000 has become 5 lakhs. And then 2,500 has become 12,000. <coughs> the amount of rebate has increased from 2,500 to 12,500. And the eligibility or the income level has been increased so that more and more people get covered by the provision of rebate. So today, resident individuals get covered, but instead of the total income being 350, it has it can be any amount up to 5 lakhs. And the maximum rebate available is 12,500. Second amendment. Now, if you can keep that first page on in front of you and have a look. The second amendment talks about surcharge. This is something something significant. If you remember your rates of surcharge, it was very simple. For an individual, if your total income exceeded 50 lakhs but did not exceed 1 crore, the surcharge rate was 10% of basic tax. And if it exceeded 1 crore, then the surcharge rate was 15% of basic tax. This used to be as per Finance Act 2018. That means this used to be previous year 1819, assessment year 1929. Now look at the changes that have happened. Look at the amendment. Haan, surcharge or amendment. Kya change hai? Dekho. Ito, the rates of surcharge have increased. And instead of keeping it simple, now there are four rates applicable. 10% remains the way it is. 15% may change okay? If the total income exceeds 1 crore, but does not exceed 2 crore, then the surcharge rate will be 15%. If it exceeds 2 crore but does not exceed 5 crore, then surcharge rate is 25%. And if it exceeds 5 crore, then the surcharge rate is 37%. This was all introduced by that finance number 2 in 2019. The budget was tax rates were announced. But that was like, uh, what do you call it? A semi-final type of a budget, an interim budget. Okay. It will be finalized when the final government comes into power. So then, the original rates were announced in Finance Act 2019. They were not applicable. Now, Finance <coughs> Number 2 Act 2019, rates apply. When surcharge was increased and increased drastically. If you think about it, your budget case, not exactly your budget, but let's put it, previous budget case, if the total income was 3 crore rupees, put an provision. 3 crore, then the rate of surcharge was 15 percent. Apo increase, okay? If the total income was 7 crore rupees, Purane budget ke hisab se, that now increases to 37 percent. So, on one hand, the rebate was increased, the discount was increased, so small taxpayers were given more relief. 
people whose income were 5 lakh, people whose income is 5 lakh or below, uh, the discount is increased from 2500 to 12500. And on the other hand, those rich taxpayers, they are now told you pay more, you contribute more. But then this, this amendment, this did not, uh, this did not go well with foreign investors, foreign investors who are not residents, who invest money into the stock market. And when they invest money into the stock market and they earn income out of it, their, their income runs into crores because basically their investment is also into crores. They would uh, input say about, say for example, 20-30 crores and sell those shares not just one company but multiple company ka shares and 20 crore ka investment and then they are selling it for say 23 crores, 24 crores. So, 3-4 crore to capital gain hi ho gaya. Non-resident ka. Other incomes to I am not considering. 3-4 crore ka during the year capital gain hoa. And earlier it was very sorted. Okay, even if it was above 1 crore, rate of surcharge was 15% only. Up to the moment your income keeps on increasing, surcharge rate also keeps on increasing. So, this was introduced by finance number 2 at 2019 but it was met with a lot of resistance. Even the common man did not like it. But foreign investors they were particularly very vocal about it. Then the government had to mellow down the surcharge rates. So then it came out with a, a different amendment, a separate amendment. Now in that amendment what happened was, they decided to, and this stuff is complicated, they decided to apply the enhanced surcharge rates only on the other incomes excluding the stock market capital gains. So when you are determining how much rate of surcharge is to be paid, you have to split the total income into parts. Total income, gross total income minus your ATC to ATO deduction, total income. Now split this total income into parts, separate out, distinguish out stock market wala capital gains. Now try and recollect, capital gains is a chapter, rates of tax. Short term capital gain, what is the rate of tax? 15% under section 111. That applies, when does triple money apply? If equity shares are sold, if units of equity oriented mutual fund are sold and they are sold through a recognized stock exchange, then short term capital gain gets taxed at a rate of 15%. Yeh tumhara section triple value. Okay. Then, what is section 112A? Long term capital gain. Long term capital gain. Rate of tax? 10% in excess of one that long term capital gain used to be. The, on what capital assets does 112A one one apply? Equity. Say all those assets for which STT is paid, all those assets which are covered in triple 1A, they are covered in 112A one one also. Difference is triple 1A is talking about short term, 112A one one is talking about long term. 112A one one may be written. That for equity shares, listed equity shares, STT must be paid at the time of purchase also and at the time of sale also. But for units of equity oriented mutual fund, STT should be paid at the time of sale. Yes. So 1 lakh rupees ka exemption milta hai. Long term capital gain minus 1 lakh, jo balance pacha, that is taxed at 10%. Yes. Achha, who gives this 1 lakh ka exemption? I mean, where is that? What I need to ask is, where is that 1 lakh ka exemption mentioned or written? Section 1 and 2 a perfect. So is it in section 10? I mean, is that one that is exempt under section 10? That means, for example, if your long-term capital gain that is covered by 1 and 2 a, if that works out to 4 lakh rupees, you will pay tax on? But how much will you include in your gross total income? 4 lakhs or the full 3 lakhs? Sorry, I mean 4 lakhs or 3 lakhs, how much will you include? 4 lakhs. 1 lakh, that's, that's the reason I asked you that question. Who gives you that 1 lakh exemption? Section. Section. 112A. Any income which is exempt under section 10, 
do you include that income in GDI? No. 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 But this one lakh is not exempt under Section 10. It's exempt under 112A. So if by selling equity shares, my long term capital gain is 4 lakh rupees, out of that 1 lakh will be exempt and 3 lakh will be taxable. Ye distinction, ye, ye, ye division, you will be doing when you calculate income tax. But when you are calculating income, when you are calculating taxable income, when you are calculating your gross total income, capital gains ke head with 3 lakh nahi, you will include the full 4 lakh. That 1 lakh which is exempt, wo bhi GTI mein include hoga, because it is not exempt as per section 10. Ye samjha? These are my stock market capital gains, listed equity shares, units of equity oriented mutual fund. Now, when surcharge rates were increased drastically like this, as I told you, those non-resident foreign investors had a problem. Now the amendment that was introduced to us, if we will take the total income and split it, section triple one a section 112A, take those capital gains different and find out the other incomes. If this other income is greater than 2 crore but less than equal to 5 crore, then the tax on this other income, on this tax amount, you will apply 25% surcharge. If the other income exceeds 5 crores, then the tax on that other income which is exceeding 5 crore, on this you will apply the enhanced rate of 37 percent. And for these capital gains, you will definitely pay tax. So tax on these capital gains, your 15 percent is the maximum rate of surcharge. The split is not to be done. Such a split is not to be done if your total income is up to 2 crores. So going in a sequence, if the total income exceeds 50 lakhs but does not exceed 1 crore, rate of surcharge is 10%, then it is 10%, don't bifurcate your total income into two parts. It is see that 10% apply around. If your total income exceeds 1 crore but does not exceed 2 crore rupees, the rate of surcharge is 15%. Do not do any splitting like this. <coughs> Logically, you may remember it like this also. What were the old rates of surcharge? 10% and 15%. So, in the time your rate of surcharge <coughs> applicable is 10% or 15%, you have to do it normally. The problem arose because 15% was increased to 25%. 15% was increased to 37%. That is where the problem arose. So when does it go to 25%? When does 25% apply? Only the total income exceeds. Now you know what the government is thinking. This is of course not the complete provision, but this is just the beginning of my discussion. Government is thinking, okay, excluding tomorrow stock market or capital gains, if your other incomes are also about 2 crore, so, so you deserve to be falling under the rate of 25%. Matlab, and the, on the same time, uh, on the other hand, I am also thinking like this. If my total income exceeded 2 crores, but only because I included the stock market or the capital gains. If my total income exceeded 2 crores, but that happened because I included the stock market or the capital gains. Then, then, once I split my total income into two parts, the other incomes are less than two crores. Mm -hmm. But the moment I take triple one and one one two a into it, the total cross is two crores. Mm -hmm. Now I will not apply the enhanced rate of 25%. Now I'll say other income is falling below two crores. The mm -hmm. so, Ustai surcharge rate 15%. In triple one a one one two a will be surcharge rate 15%. Agar amendment nahi hota, 
if this thing was not income, so the moment total income crosses two crore, imagine karo, you and me are two individuals. I have, both of us have other incomes, both of us have triple money, one one two. My other income is one and a half crore, one and a half crore, and uh, triple money, one one two is say seventy lakhs. This is one point five crore, and that is seventy lakh rupees for me. Now, does the total cross 2 crore? Yes. yes. But that crosses 2 crore because I included the stock market wala capital gain. If I remove that stock market wala capital gain, then the total income is below 2 crore rupees. Then why should I pay enhanced surcharge of 25%? But you are someone whose other incomes is 2.5 crore. And stock market wala capital gain is 70 lakh rupees, just like me. Now your total income, 2.5 crore plus 70 lakhs, 3.2 crores. Mm -hmm. Normally thinking, 3.2 crore falls in that 25% bracket. Mm -hmm. But when you split it, you realize that stock market capital gain is 70 lakhs, and other income is 2.5 crore. Mm -hmm. That means you anyways are earning other income above 2 crore. You mm -hmm. didn't need the stock market capital gain to pull your total income above 2 crore. So your total income is above 2 crore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then the tax that you calculate on that other income, surcharge is always calculated on income tax amount. Yes. The tax that you calculate on that other income, 2.5 crore jo tax calculate kiya, apply the enhanced surcharge rate only on that tax. Yes. But the 2.5 crore tax kina, but for tax day, you will apply surcharge at the rate of 25 rupees. And on the balance, 70 lakh rupees. Tax calculate karo, triple one a, one one two a ka rate apply karke. And what's your tax? I'll put 50%. Mm -hmm. Sub -sub. Okay. Sub -sub. Seriously, same logic, same explanation can be taken for 5 crores. Okay, total income exceeds 5 crores. Total income exceeds 5 crores. But when you remove out that stock market while capital gain, the total income falls below 5 crores. Then why should you pay 37% as enhanced rate? Pattern, Sub -sub. <laughs> If you flip something from 5 pages, Precisely speaking, uh, yeah, piece number four, four to begin with. Rate of surcharge originally introduced by Finance Number Two Act 2019 with those four rates. Then the Taxation Laws Amendment Act 2019 came into picture where surcharge rates <coughs> reduced. Now have a look. First point, total income including triple one a and 112A exceeds 50 lakh but does not exceed 1 crore. Rate applicable 10%. No splitting, nothing doing. 10% normal rate. Where the total income including triple one a and 112A exceeds 1 crore. I went to the next page exceeds 1 crore but does not exceed 2 crore. Rate of surcharge 15%, no split point three says split start one. Where the total income, excluding income under section triple one a and one one two a exceeds 2 crore, excluding. But you remove the stock market capital gain and still your total taxable income exceeds 2 crore but does not exceed 5 crore. Now the surcharge rate will be 25%. But then, the paragraph thereafter, the rate of surcharge on the income tax payable on the portion of income which is covered under triple one a and one one two a not exceeding 15%. <coughs> you will not apply 25% on the entire total income. Yeah. Only if your other incomes, excluding stock market or capital gain, is greater than 2 crores. So, he will enhance rate of life. You will get a better picture. Just don't jump to any conclusion right now. Put a table cut Point four. When the total <coughs> excluding triple one a and one one two a exceeds five crores, but mm -hmm. you don't need to include that stock market or capital gain by default. Your income five crore ke upar hai. Toh ekdam super rich aami hai. Then your rate of surcharge is thirty seven percent, and the rate of surcharge on the income tax payable. On the triple one a and one one two a, that will be not exceeding fifty percent. Mm -hmm. Now, it is also crore. It is also crore. Point three and point four also crore. Point three. 
you are excluding triple one a and one one two a. Point four also, you are excluding triple one a and one one two a. After excluding those incomes, your balance total income is crossing two crores, is crossing five crores. But then a third example to visualize. जो जो मैंने already ऐसा मेरा example लिया था कि my other incomes are one point five crores. And my stock market capital gain is 70 lakh rupees. Now what's my total income? 2.2 crores. Does it exceed 2 crore? Yes. Normally thinking, yes. Now, do you fit up my example in, if you, if you can keep page 4 and page 5 open simultaneously. Can you cover this example in the first point, point number one? Obviously not. Income is above one crore. Can you cover it in point number two? I'm asking you pretty stupid questions here. Point one may total income exceeds 50 lakh but does not exceed one crore. Mera to total income 2.2 crore hai. Point two may total income exceeds one crore but does not exceed two crore. Those two points are not applicable. Mm -hmm. Is this example fitting up in point number three? No. Yes, I suppose I know through so much of the same. Overall my income, on a, on a totality basis, my income exceeds two crores. But if I exclude the triple one A and one point two A, total income is less than two crore. So point three may cover any one? By that implication, point four may be the right example cover you want. Uh -huh. go to the next page. Up next page, they go to the Including triple money and one point two A exceeds two crores. But oh, point three or point four may cover you. You have an example. Up such as read can you you read 15%. Answer this. 15% of what tax? Both tax. Both taxes. The tax on other incomes also and tax on the stock market capital gain also. Sara tax will be 15%. Meaning, if you understand the implication, Agar, this is my example. And say I create your example where this is 70 lakhs and this is 3 crore. And this is 3 crore 70 lakhs. Had this split wala thing not happened, <coughs> then your surcharge would have been. Had this split wala thing not happened, but this is what the amendment is. Mm -hmm. This is the amendment as per that finance number 2 act. Mm -hmm. And yes, split wala cheese is as per that taxation was amendment act. So, exactly, yes, split wala cheese pulls up. And we are applying the Basic, comment, basic change that happened. So, then your surcharge would have been 25% on the entire tax. Yes. So, I'll say tax on 3 crore 70 lakhs. Up, kya hoga? When you split, you will say 70 lakhs into jo tax aya, say A rupees, tax rate apply kar di aapne. 3 crores into the respective tax rate, ye B rupees ka tax aya. Uh, this is the tax on triple one A and one one two. Its surcharge rate cannot exceed fifty percent. Or its surcharge rate will be twenty five percent. Now compare it. So earlier, though you were paying tax on three point seven crore, and pure pay twenty five percent. Up to twenty five percent is applicable only on the tax on three crore. Stock market wala capital gain is not subjected to that enhanced rate, it is subject to the lower rate of 15%. Mm -hmm. And in my case, mein, mere case mein, what would have been normally the scenario? Mm -hmm. I would have calculated tax on 2 crore 20 lakhs, or is pay, I would have paid 25 lakhs. Because of the amendment now, where do I fall in that last point of the table? Yes. So now my surcharge rate will be 15%. That means 
excluding this income, my income falls below 2 crore rupees. So below 2 crore ka rate is 15% only. And stock market wala capital gain surcharge rate is anyways restricted to 15%. But my overall 15% rate is not going to be a little bit of a relief. Obvious. Honestly, you can understand the whole thing. Are you sure? Can you move ahead? Okay. So now let's do it. Come back to page number 1. The first table, tax rate relating to individual health and education says 4% surcharge, we've done the discussion, rebate increases from 2500 to 2500, slab rates have not changed at all. For study purposes, I've printed the slab rates, mm -hmm. but the slab rates that you have in your material are the same slab rates that are printed in this material. So slab rates, there has been no change in the slab rate. HUF, AOP, BOI, artificial juridical person, Everything identical to individual. Slab rates apply to HUF, AOP, BOI also. Rebate is not applicable to them. Rebate is applicable only to resident individuals. Surcharge rates, the way they have increased for individual, they have also increased for HUF, AOP, BOI. So, what is the surcharge higher rate? 10, 15, 25, 37. They also apply. Various split cheese is also equally applicable. Remember, this split wala cheese is not applicable to all persons. What I mean is, surcharge rates have not been increased for companies and firms. Mm -hmm. Companies and firms, jo rates of surcharge aapne padhe the for previous year 1819, they are the same applicable for previous year 1920. The government increased the surcharge rates of only those guys who were covered by slab rates. And thereafter, it decreased the surcharge rate by doing this split wala formula only for those guys. Matlab, higher rate of surcharge, 25% and 37% is applicable only for slab rate wale persons. Mm -hmm. Then the split wala funda is also applicable for those slab rate wale persons. For companies and firms, they are covered by flat rates. Their surcharge rates have not increased. They were the same rates. Don't go split with karne ka stock market gain alag karne ka koi matlab hai nahi because the rates of surcharge are not changed at all. So, firm ka tax rate pad lo. Go through that thing. Firm ka tax rate. You may remember it. Yaad nahi ho to ipad dekho zara. On page 3 and on page 3 you will also find the slab rates. Just go through them once.
two years ago. Now, for Finance Act 2018, it was previous year. Previous year 1819. Two years ago would be previous year 1619. So, if I have turn over, for previous year 1619 was equal to 50 crores. Then the rate of surcharge applicable was 95%. Hence, the rate would be that is previous year 1819. Now when we come to previous year 1920, two years reverse will mean 1790. And the amendment is that 250 crores has been increased to 400 crores. Other than that, there is no change as far as the company rates are concerned. Foreign company tax rates, absolutely same. Domestic company, there is this only one change. 250 crore has become 400 crore. And of course, two years minus crore is obviously other than that, company rates are absolutely the same.
ये मेगा इम्प्लीकेशन है जो पहले डीएलओ भी बनता था विल नाउ बिकम एन एस ओ पी बिकॉज यू कैन हैव एन एडिशनल एस ओ पी नाउ इन सेट ऑफ वन एस ओ पी यू कैन हैव टू एस ओ पी द सेकेंड एस ओ पी दैट यू सिलेक्ट और क्लियर यूज टू बी ट्रीटेड एज डी एल ओ पी एंड नाउ विल बी ट्रीटेड एज एस ओ पी सो इट्स अ बेनिफिशियल प्रोविजन फॉर द ओनर दैट यू कैन टेक टू प्रॉपर्टीज एज एस ओ पी इट्स नॉट मच ऑफ अ बेनिफिट क्वाइट फाइनली बिकॉज हाउ डू यू कंप्यूट इनकम इन केस ऑफ एस ओ पी
bulk point. The aggregate deduction for both the ASOPs combined cannot cross the tax. Now you may recollect me speaking like this. Thus, we will tell you that the owner is now allowed to choose one name, two properties as ASOP. But as a passing reference, when you go like this amendment does not make much of a sense or this amendment does not give much of a benefit to you. Reason. Property 1, individually calculated crop deduction. Property 2, individually calculated crop deduction. Since you are talking SOP, how does your competition begin? And it is the only deduction possible is this reduction 24B. Now don't do calculations combined. Calculations separate. So 2 lakh car limit and 30,000 car limit will be separate. But once you can get your two deductions, वो दोनों का aggregate cannot cross two lakhs. अच्छा, which means नहीं मतलब है, मतलब है। प्राइमा फेसी लगता है कि क्या नॉनसेंस है? ये नॉनसेंस लगेगा if both the loans are taken after 19. Both the loans are taken after 19 for acquisition and construction. And each property ka interest is about 2 lakh rupees. <coughs> so SOP 1, interest paid 3 lakhs. SOP 2, interest paid 4 lakhs. Pehle kya karte thi? Sorry. Ab kaise working karo ghe? Combine 3 plus 4, 7 lakhs? <laughs> Nain. 3 lakh compared with 2 lakhs? Reduction 2 lakhs. 4 lakh compared with 2 lakhs? Reduction 2 lakhs. But the aggregate of both is restricted to 2 lakhs. This is where you find the cap nonsense. But if both the properties, both the properties, the loan was taken before 99. So 30,000 for other. Each SOP, the reduction taken is a maximum possible. 30, 30 ka maximum reduction is possible, that is what you've taken. And the combined is within 2 lakh rupees. So total 60,000 ka reduction. Samjha? Yeah. SOP number 1, loan is before 19. Interest amount 25,000. SOP number 2, loan is after 19. Interest amount 1 lakh 90,000, 190. SOP 1 ka loan before 99, 25,000 ka interest. Within the limit? Mm -hmm. SOP number 2, loan is after 1999, 1 lakh 90,000 kind of within the limit. So both of them independently speaking are within their limits. But 1 lakh 90 plus 25, the aggregate crosses 2 lakhs. If this last amendment was not inserted, if the aggregate should not exceed 2 lakhs, then you may insert 2 lakhs. So you would have been able to take 25 and 190 pura, so your SOP loss would have crossed 2 lakh rupees. Now government does not want that to happen. So, the maximum deduction, sorry, aggregate total 2 lakh cross nahi ho sakta. But do not straight away do your calculations combined. Calculations separate your own. If you flip some pages and come to page number 80. You find three examples with all such permutation combinations. Go through it, please.
if you can now look at look at page six. When do you consider the property as a DLOP? It's not an SOP and it's not a DLOP. Can somebody have property held in a stock inventory? Yes. For them the provision was that if your flags are unsold, they are in a stock in trade and they are unsold. Since you are still the owner, those properties will be treated as your DLOP. Mm -hmm. But then the relaxation given was from the date on which you receive the certificate of completion of construction, from the from that date, rather not exactly from that date, the financial year in which you get that certificate. From that end of the financial year, a timeline of one year was given to you. After, for that one year, the assessing officer, the income tax officer will not treat your unsold properties as BNP. <coughs> After that one year gets over and you still have some flats unsold, then the DLOP provisions will apply. So, systematic thinking, <coughs> if I am a builder and I have constructed some flats and my construction got over, say today, my construction got over today 1st of March 2020. Then this year is the year in which I received a certificate of completion of construction. Today, <coughs> today I have say 20 flags unsold. I was given a timeline of one year from end of the financial year in which this certificate of construction is given to me. So if I am talking about 1st March 2020, it means I am talking about financial year 1920. So from the end of financial year 1920, that is 31st March 2020, I was given a time of one year. For that one year, the assessing officer will not apply the DLOP provisions. He will not apply the DLOP provisions. After that, that means 31st March 2020 plus one year, 31st March 2021. Till that date, DLOP provisions will not apply. As on 1st April 2021, just say one year any flag which is still unsold, still unsold, now that will be treated as a DLOP for me. This is the original provision. The amendment is very simple. At one year time, it has been extended to two years. So from the financial year in which you got the certificate of count construction, instead of counting, counting one year from the end, you count two years from the end. DLOP provisions will not be applied for those two years. After that, anything remaining unsold will be treated as DLOP. This is your 23 subsection 5. If you can read the amendment column and the example column, then go through it, then we move ahead. Thank <laughs> you. 
page number 8. The last two amendments, as per Finance Act 2019, the budget before the election. Simple as amendment, it's a matter of just remembering it. I got his TDS chapter, Pada. Push random. Who does TDS? Who does TDS? If TDS is to be done on rent, rent, the section number is 194i. I am not troubling you with section number 9. But, and in fact, for that matter, let me not trouble you with the section also. So, forget it. I am not, not asking you questions. We will discuss the amendments later. You may not have studied TDS. It's pretty evident. And TDS is a chapter where you need to study so that you know the details. So, I am not testing you on your TDS knowledge. I say we didn't hear. Sorry. Some joke is, rent ka TDS hai. So, section 194i puts a threshold limit of 180,000. Okay, if the amount of rent that you pay to a person exceeds 180,000, then tax is to be deducted. Tax is to be deducted. This limit has been increased from 180 to 240. Your amendment. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when you are talking about interest, interest, so interest on debentures, interest on bonds, there is interest on securities. That is section number 193. There is no amendment in 193. After 193, you have a connected section 194A, which is talking about other interest incomes. Interest other than interest on securities. Fixed deposits, recurring deposits ka interest hai. Bank me jo FD rakha, post office me jo FD rakha, FD, fixed deposits and recurring deposits. The threshold limit was 10,000. That means if the interest on FD and RD exceeded 10,000, then you were supposed to do PDS. For senior citizens, <coughs> The limit was 50,000. So, budget commitment, the finance act 2018 commitment. So, people like us, when we make a fixed deposit with a bank and the bank pays interest exceeding 10,000, bank will do DDS. If bank pays interest to a senior citizen and the interest exceeds 50,000, then bank will do DDS. Now, the amendment as per our finance act 2019 is 10,000 limit tha, that is increased to 40,000. Matha basically TDS ke limits may increase. Eh? So when you study the TDS chapter, you just have to remember the revised limits now. Okay, rent ka 180 ka, that has increased to 240. And interest on FD and RD, so 10,000 ka, wo 40,000 ho gaya. Ye tumara page number 8 ka, pehla do amendment hai. Dekh lo fada fada, is much hai. Senior citizen is the same, it remains 50,000. Yes, MDP value exceeds 50,000. So, the amount receiver will be taxable. 
then you may remember this also okay along with no consideration there was also the concept of inadequate consideration so if the market value minus consideration if that difference exceeds 50000 then the amount becomes taxable i don't know if you remember the specifics for immovable property immovable property which was received for inadequate consideration it wasn't just 50000 kalimeter there was that 5%. Kuch agar yaad ho, 105% ka ek amendment tha to hai budget ke hisab se so. There was an amendment in capital gains also and there was an amendment in IFO also. So, if the inadequate consideration amount exceeds 5% of the consideration or 50,000 whichever is high or the two, to IFO's provision is taxable. Provision remains the same. There is no change there. The small clarificatory changes that Provision applies to the receiver. Whoever is the receiver, individual insurance company form, everybody is covered. The situation that arose was people who are non-residents were receiving some of money outside India as gifts. Now the provision is taxable for receiver. So the argument put up was since the receiver is a non-resident outside India, income arises outside India, accrues outside India, so it's not taxable. Matlab, if you are a person in the UK and I send 5 lakh rupees to you from India to UK, from the receiver's perspective, you received it outside India. And as a non-resident, you are receiving it outside India, so it's not taxable for you in India. <coughs> This is the small technicality where even if you receive more than 50,000, you are escaping tax just because you are a non-resident who was receiving it outside India. And your technical argument was, it's received outside India and you are non-resident, so scope of income is also taxable. So many such cash outflows were not chargeable to tax. Now, what did the government do? Government did very smartly. This transaction was deemed to accrue or arise in India. But as per section 9, any sum of money received by a non-resident outside India is deemed to accrue or arise in India. Now the moment you say deemed to accrue or arise in India, section 9, it means the moment you say deemed to accrue in India, is coming up in India taxable over here. Mm. Even if you are, treat, you are a non-resident, you are receiving the money, receipt, mm. is definitely outside India, but we are going to assume it, that the transaction India may accrue. Mm. Now this amendment was announced, uh, if I remember correctly, fifth yeah, fifth July. July. It was announced by the second budget. The second budget was announced fifth of July. This means the amendment is effective fifth of July. Generally, every amendment is applicable from the start of the year, beginning of the previous year. But then, ye amendment ka drafting hi in logon ne aisa kiya that if the sum of money is received by the non-resident on or after fifth July. So it is deemed to accrue or arise in India. Which means by implication, if the sum of money is received outside India but before 5th of July, so income tax act may give a provision before 5th of July exist in Ikata. Then you can still take the argument that income is not taxable because it accrues outside India, it is received outside India. Yeah. I have given you certain examples, so examples so independently through Padlena, there is nothing challenging there. I want to discuss a challenging example before you right now. If you find it worthy, then write it on the board. The amendment is applicable for amounts received on or after 5th July. First thing to keep in mind. Second thing to keep in mind. The taxability section of IFOS says total amount received should be greater than 50,000, not individual amounts. Mm -hmm. Now you understand what I am thinking. Mm -hmm. What if as a non-resident, you have received some amounts before 5th July, received some amounts after 5th July, 2019. What's our previous year now? 1990. The so first April 2019, start of the previous year, to 5th, to 4th July 2019. Budget mm -hmm. you receive some money. No consideration, gift. Then 5th July 2019, budget all day, up to end of the year, you receive some money. 
Now, IFS का taxability provision क्या बोलता है? We are doing it on a total basis. ठीक है? Total basis पे करना है। चलो समझ गया। But if it is before fifth July, तो scope of income के हिसाब से that income is not accruing or arising in India, तो वो India में taxable नहीं। On or after fifth of July है, तो it is deemed to accrue in India, तो taxable होगा। So my question to you is, I am combinedly thinking scope of income. I have a scope provision and my question is how will you decide what amount is tax by including the total deal in the year? Yeah, only on or after 5th July. Because any amounts that you have received before 5th of July are by default not taxable as per scope of income only. So I have a scope of total in the total. What should that total include? Entire amount, pure sal, 12 months ka amount? No, only those amounts which are received after 5th of July. Okay, what is the total amount that exceeds 50,000? Before 5th July plus after 5th July. Total amount exceeds 50,000 rupees. I think you have predicted the example also. But on or after 5th of July, the amount is below 50,000. If you then think nothing will be taxable. Because before 5th of July, amounts are again as exempt. On or after 5th of July is the only thing that you have to total and that total is below 50,000. So, taxable nahi hoga. Are we clear? Yes. Ek par part lo, sir. Section number 9 wala ho amendment. Did the exam first part lo? from 40% to 
and now it's a reverse. 60 percent exempt and 40 percent is 40 percent becomes tax. This is your 10, 12 a. Huh. Again, 10, 34 a. Now this discussion is a bit, bit important. When there is a buyback of shares, the head of income is capital gains. When buyback happens, the the provision that originally used to exist was that buyback used to be covered by section 46A, which is a section of capital gains. You won't find 46A there. Which is a section of capital gains which generally is taught at CFI level, inter level pay. There is not much to study here because 46A specifically talks of shares or other securities, like other securities like bonds and debentures. 46A is a very old provision and it tells you nothing greater. It says full value of consideration minus cost of acquisition, ye tumara capital gain hoga. Cost of acquisition will be nothing but your issue price of the shares, the price at which you acquired the share. And full value of consideration will be the buyback price. This section used to apply and to be honest, it's still applicable for shares and securities. Then a section was created specifically for unlisted shares. If you are talking about unlisted shares, then for the shareholder, the whole buyback is exempt under 1034 because the domestic company is supposed to pay tax similar to DDT and that was 20% plus surcharge of 12% plus health and education size of 4%. The whole scenario is that buyback is always buyback is always done out of reserves and surplus. So the extra money that you will pay to the shareholder, the company will get that money from the reserves that it has. From the same reserves, the company would declare a dividend. If dividend was declared, the provisions of DDT would apply. Mm -hmm. To prevent DDT, that same reserve was distributed to the shareholder as buyback. And it became taxable for the shareholder as per 46A. And if the shares are long term, the shareholder can claim the benefit of indexation also. Mm. So moment you claim indexation benefit, profit element decreases. Mm. So tax decreases. Mm. Meaning that reserves and surplus which was supposed to be distributed as buyback, sorry, as dividend. Mm. And government would have got DDT. You are giving it to the shareholder in the form of buyback, avoiding DDT and telling shareholder you pay tax because you will get the benefit of indexation. You don't get any indexation benefit when it comes to DDT calculation. Um, ye malpractice ko rokne ke liye, 1034A was introduced. Which said if it is unlisted shares, private limited companies actually used to do this. Private limited companies used to do this as, as a method to avoid DDT. So we said if it's unlisted shares, 46A does not apply. Capital gains as a chapter does not apply. They are making the income exempt, <coughs> section 10, exempt. And <coughs> domestic company will pay this tax as per section 115QA. And the drafting was made exactly identical to DDT provisions. But if say DDT is 15%, percent they say 20%. But everything is the same. DDT ka section is 115O and this is 115QA. Not focusing on section numbers, what I want you to do is understand that buyback is ka income hai plus shareholder ka income hai. But tax is being paid by the domestic company just like dividend distribution tax is paid by domestic company. Ye purana provision hai. Finance Act 2019, sorry, Finance Number 2 Act 2019. This, the second budget, covered or extended this 1034A and 115QA to listed shares also. Listed also. Bola, 
listed shares will also be now covered under 1034 a and the domestic company will have to pay tax similar to DT. Now, is no problem kya hai? There's no problem as such. Okay, private companies are covered. Now, all companies are covered. But practically the problem that arose was listed companies which had already announced the buyback before 5th July. They would have announced the buyback keeping in mind the income tax act that existed on that day. And the act that existed on that day covered only unlisted shares. Now if I am a domestic company, a listed company and I want to actually do buyback, my thought process would be, can I do buyback? I will not have to pay any tax. My shareholder will pay tax under the chapter of capital gains. Okay? 15th May 2019, I have buyback announced. 15th May 2019. Election time chal raha tha. But listed company buyback announced. Execute me more. Buyback was announced. Execution will be pending. But company ne bola ke, we will buy back shares. Then at that point of time, Company's own calculations would be okay, I just have to pay the buyback money to the shareholder. Yes. I don't have to pay any tax to the government. Up to 5th of July, budget ke bolte ho, okay, for previous year 1920, buyback of listed shares are also covered by section 115QA, shareholder ke exempt. Shareholder to khush hoga exempt. But company bolte ho, okay, now in addition to the buyback price, I have to pay extra tax also. Yes. Then the company told the government that you have the law, you have the buyback announced. Then the law was different. Keeping that in mind, we have announced the buyback. Now you are changing the law. Then the government said, okay. Then you have to pay the buyback. Then the government said, okay. If the buyback, this amendment is a taxation clause amendment in 2019. Then the amendment is a list data cover. Then the company has been asked. Then the government said, okay, let's go. Withdraw. Withdraw means? It said if the buyback was announced, publicly announced, before 5th of July, then this provision will not be applicable, the old law will apply. Meaning today if a buyback is announced? Section number one, 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 not applicable, not applicable. If you not apply, then what do you apply? 46 A. What was the law existing before 5th of July? The capital gain will be taxable in the hands of the shareholder. Samsha, the interpretation is not over. You have not observed two points categorically. You have not observed it. Board they go. 115QA is applicable only to domestic companies. Whereas 46A is sale for sale, shares in the company. Company in the company. 46A is sale for company. If you understand what I am trying to hint at, buyback done by a domestic company. Yes, 115QA will apply. What if buyback is done by a foreign company? 46A has to apply. 5th of July ke pahile ho, 5th of July ke baad ko farak nahi karta. Yeh samjha? Dousra chiz jo apne observe nahi kiya hai. 115QA only covers shares. 46A covers shares and sigma. Which means if debentures and bonds are bought back, you don't call them as buyback, but it's redemption. But if redemption of debentures and bonds happen, then definitely 1152 is not applicable even if it is done by a domestic company. Yes. That means... Yes. 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 That means the care that you have to take is you have to observe if it's a domestic company are we talking about listed and listed shares? If we are talking about listed shares when was the buyback announced publicly before 5th July, after 5th July then your, very, the, your calculations, your implications will change. But if it is debentures Bonds, 46A will apply. If it's a foreign company, if it's a domestic company, unlisted shares. The unlisted shares provision was always there. 
फिफ्थ ऑफ जुलाई का कोई इंपॉर्टेंस है तो बिफोर फिफ्थ जुलाई आफ्टर फिफ्थ जुलाई वन वन फाइव क्यू बिल अप्लाई ये समझा पढ़ो सर
For businesses, it was 8%. Yeah. But if you remember, 6% is also available. Yeah. Okay. available. Yeah. The correct word would be 6% will be applicable yeah. if the amount is received via yeah. these three modes. Now, yeah. these three modes may be any other electronic mode as may be prescribed at IRO. This is not expense section, this is income yeah. section. Yeah. Similarly, if you can reconnect, we have 50C or 50C. Capital gains chapter, section 50C. Stop it ready, capital gains chapter. 50C, that if the consideration is less than the stamp duty value. Now, we have to say that if agreement date and registration date are different and the stamp duty rates have changed, you will take the stamp duty value of the date of agreement but for that to happen. You have to receive the consideration or a part of it, either by account pay check, account pay by draft or ECS. This meditation over through any other electronic mode as may be prescribed. This is your section number 50C, which is in capital gains. A similar section is existing in the chapter of business profession also by the number 43C8. When you go back to your books, you will observe. 43C is land and building held as property building, PGBP chapter. 50C is land and building held as a capital asset, capital gain chapter. But the sections are identical. I will discuss with you one or five sections. 35A B, capital expenditure on specified business. 43 one, actual cost. 43A subsection 3, any other revenue expenditure. 43 C A land and building held as stock in trade. 50 C land and building held as capital asset. And 44 A B presumptive taxation. Three sections are of incomes, three sections of expense. But whenever the word used is account pay check, account pay bank draft, or ECS, it has been extended any other electronic mode as we be prescribed. They close a question.
business provision chapter, no TD is no reduction. If you don't deduct tax, expenditure gets disallowed. If you deduct tax but don't deposit it within the unit of filing return of income, then the expenditure gets disallowed. How much is the expense that gets disallowed? 100% if the receiver is a non resident 30% if the receiver is a resident. Okay. Then towards the end, we have seen a scenario where huh, that exceptional case that uh, we were talking about where when the payer has not deducted tax, but the receiver who is a resident person has filed a return of income and paid income tax. Then for the payer, there won't be there will not be anything disallowed. Everything will be allowed as a reduction. It will be deemed it will be deemed that tax was deducted and the tax was deposited. Both these assumptions will be made on the day the receiver, who is a resident person, files a return of income. And then according to those assumptions, you are assuming that tax is deducted, you are assuming that tax is deposited. So in a way you are assuming that the TDS liabilities are fulfilled. So as a payer, even though you have not done TDS, expenditure will still be allowed. But that exceptional case was applicable if the receiver was a resident. Finance number 2 Act 2019 has extended that to non-residents also. That means now that provision has become far more liberal. Internationally, internationally, uh, when India participates into various tax conferences, one of the criticisms that happen is that uh, at many places there is double taxation. Where a particular amount gets taxed twice. Like for example, a company pays income tax and then when it distributes dividend, it pays dividend distribution tax. <coughs> That is double taxation. Profit is already taxed. And also paper work is done DDT. This was another example. That if I am the payer and say I am making a payment to a resident person without deducting tax. But the resident person is paying tax and filing for return. Then for me the expenditure is allowed. Tax is only collected from the resident person. Single taxation. But if I am making a payment to a non-resident, then that exceptional case was not available. Then if I make a payment to non-resident and I don't deduct tax, then the expense got disallowed to me. And even if the non-resident filed a return of income and paid tax, still the expense was disallowed to me, 100% expense. But the amount involved, say for example, is 4 lakhs. The 4 lakh became taxable as income for the non-resident. And 4 lakh was fully disallowed for me also. So there is this double taxation. And therefore too, because India was criticized for this double taxation in its income tax laws, he amendment Can okay, like the benefit was extended to me as a payer if the receiver was a resident. Now that benefit will be extended if the receiver is a non-resident. That means if the non-resident receiver has filed a return of income and paid tax, then for me that deemed the provision will apply. Deemed that tax is deducted. Deemed that tax is deposited. And so for me, even if I have not done PDS, expense will be allowed, whether the receiver is a resident or not. What was that? This is on page number 10.
प्रेसिडेंट को रिडक्शन का प्रोविजनों का पेयर को एक्सपेंस करना होगा प्रोविजन पेयर को ही डिडक्शन देता था कौन सा तो डिसलाउ किसके लिए करेगा बिकॉज एक्सपेंस उसका है बट वेन द पेयर वॉज मेकिंग अ पेमेंट टू अ रेसिडेंट विदाउट डिडक्टिव टैक्स यू आर सी बींग that tax is deducted etc and then you were allowing the deduction to the <coughs> matlab this assumption was done only if the receiver was a resident person but assumption kiya jata tha payer ke liye aapko assumption kiya jayega payer ke liye whether the receiver is a resident or a non resident ye provision samajh pada yes sir okay another important provision what is 43b
non-banking financial companies are also covered in the list of 43B. A difficulty, don't read it from the material unless and until I simplify it on the board. Honestly, do not, do not. It's an NDFC. Full form it will be a bit smaller. It's a non-banking, so it's not a bank. It's a financial company, so it will give loans. To operate as an NBFC, you have to get yourself registered with the RBI. RBI Act is a permission. So you can call yourself as an NBFC. Now, NBFC are of two types, broadly speaking. One, this is the type of NBFC which is a deposit taking NBFC. A deposit taking NBFC means an NBFC which takes deposits from the public. So it's an NBFC, it has its own share capital and in addition to that, it takes deposits from public and then takes this money and gives it as loans. It can give it as loan for business purposes also, housing loans also. So it is lending money as an NBFC but it is borrowing money from the general public by taking deposits. So, NBFC balance sheet, liability side, there will be deposits from public as a liability. Money taken as deposits. This is a deposit taking NBFC. The second type of NBFC is a non-deposit taking NBFC. Meaning, this is a NBFC which is doing the lending and borrowing business but does not take deposits from the public. So whatever share capital it has generated on its own, whatever profits it has generated by doing business, all of that is only given out as loans. It does not go to the public and take deposits. A non-deposit taking, yeah, deposit taking, yes or no, income tax act may income. This is written in RBI Act, this is written in Banking Regulation Act. Fahasi meaning uthaya and Income Tax Act may just more terms use kiya. The meaning is not there in Income Tax Act. Income Tax Act may meaning develop nahi kiya. Income Tax Act may bula Banking Regulation Act mein jo likha na, wo meaning follow karo. RBI Act mein jo likha wo meaning follow karo. Ab ye non-deposit taking, is mein there are two further divisions made. One is called as systemically important non-deposit taking NBFC. A long term and because it's a lengthy term, it may be confusing. Is the way this It is an NBFC. It does not take deposits from the public. But it is systemically important. It's come up with one. When you look up the dictionary meaning of this term, systemically, it means that this is important for the system as a whole. That means for the whole financial system, this is an important organization then it is a systemically important. From the system's perspective, it is an important non-deposit taking NBFC. Sir, iska matlab kya ho? System ke liye important matlab? System ke liye important matlab? Iska total assets are greater than or equal to 500 crores. Aur ye jo balance bacha, ye others. Classification is almost low. 43B, once I insert the amendment, it's going to be too god damn simple. A non-banking financial company either takes deposits from the public or does not take deposit from the public. If it does not take deposit from the public, it means it has its own funds generated, which it gives out as loans. And those own funds generated will represent the assets of the company. Matlab, it's a non NBFC. It has not taken deposits from public, but the share capital aya, the profits aya, that is shown on the liability side. But the money from that share capital, etc., is on the asset side. 
शेयर कैपिटल अब ये बैलेंस शीट रीड करने का मेथड है शेयर कैपिटल इज रिटर्न ऑन द लाइबिलिटी साइड बट वेर इज दैट शेयर कैपिटल का मनी दैट मनी इज ऑन दी एसेट साइड कहीं ना कहीं बैंक अकाउंट में पड़ा है कहीं वर्किंग कैपिटल में पड़ा है दैट एसेट्स द टोटल एसेट्स दैट दिस कंपनी हैज आर 500 करोड़ और मोर देन दैट मतलब दिस इज सच अ लार्ज ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इन द एसेट्स दैट इट दैट इट हैज आर 500 करोड़ और मोर तो फॉर द फाइनेंशियल स्ट्रक्चर फॉर दैट सिस्टम इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट but it does not take deposits from the public deposit nahi leta but self generated funds are so much that the total amount of funds are 500 crores or more and others ka matlab kya hoga ye dono ka matlab se pare that the total assets are less than less than 500 crores section 43b is applicable here Section 43B is applicable here. Section 43B is not applicable here. I'll give you the intention. Easy. थोड़ा सोचो. Who is this NDFC? Lender or borrower? When it comes to the chapter of PGBP, the businessman has taken the loan. From NDFC, I am the NDFC. I have taken deposits from public and given it to him as loans for business purposes. So I am a NDFC. It's a deposit taking NDFC. He has borrowed capital from a NDFC who takes deposits from the public. So for him, interest as an expense will be allowed as a deduction according to 43B. Now you give me what 43B is. Interest is, is? मतलब उसका interest expense will be allowed as a deduction to him if if payment is made. But that means the moment he makes the payment to NBFC, he gets a deduction. That means NBFC will receive income. NBFC has taken deposits from public. So public को भी interest देना पड़ेगा. You are the public. I took deposits from you and I told you 10% per annum is total paid. And I am giving loan to someone at 12% per annum. Now 10% to pay to you. I must have funds. So how did we generate funds? उस बंदे को बोला. Borrower, your interest will be allowed as a deduction if you make the payment. So the overall impact will be the moment he makes the payment, he gets an income tax deduction. Yes. This means NBFC gets money, yes. and once NBFC gets the money, it will be in the position to pay interest to the public. Yes. Deposit taking, so much better. Now non-deposit taking, but the public is not involved. Well. But this is an NBFC whose total assets are 500 crores or more, and it has given loans. अब ये लोन पे इंटरेस्ट आएगा अच्छा सो हाउ डू आई गेट द मनी टू गेट दिस लोन सेल्फ क्रिएटेड सेल्फ क्रिएटेड कुड बी शेयर कैपिटल है या खुद का ही प्रॉफिट्स एंड दोस प्रॉफिट्स आर गिवन एज लोन नाउ इफ यू थिंक शेयर कैपिटल इज गिवन एज लोन टू हिम मतलब आई वेंट टू शेयर होल्डर्स आई डिड गो टू द जनरल पब्लिक एंड आस्क फॉर डिपॉजिट्स आई वेंट टू शेयर होल्डर्स आई टुक देयर शेयर कैपिटल आई गिव इट टू हिम एज अ लोन and i am of that huge a size that my total asset value is 500 crore ya usse zyada ab he is told ki you have taken a loan from an nbfc which is not taking deposits from the public but for the system it is important because it is a huge nbfc in size yes to mera asset value hai 600 700 crore 1000 crore hai मतलब पूरे फाइनेंशियल स्ट्रक्चर के हिसाब से आई एम अ वेरी बिग ऑर्गेनाइजेशन आई एम इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर द सिस्टम इफ आई क्रम्बल डाउन तो इट विल बैडली इंपैक्ट मेनी पीपल अब आई नीड टू इंश्योर कि माय इनकम इज विद मी इन लिक्विड फॉर्म इट शुड नॉट बी जस्ट रिसीवेबल 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 इट मस्ट बी रिसीव्ड आल्सो ये रिसीव हमने अचीव कैसे किया बोला टू पेयर है तो पे करेगा तो डिडक्शन मिलेगा सो व्हेन आई गिव अ लोन आई एम अ एनबीएफसी 
who did not take deposits from the public but gave my own funds as loan to him. So when he will pay interest, don't you think this interest will be available to me to be able to satisfy my shareholders by paying dividend to them? Yes. Uh, payment karne ke liye, I must have funds with me. Yes. So, how do I create funds in my hands? How do I create income in my hands? I don't say income is receivable. I say income is received. Guess it? By telling that guy, ki tu pay karega to deduction milega. Tu pay nahi karega to expense disallow jayega. Frankly, you understood this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Avoid sample or amendment for upper. Please go seriously padna. In the example, I have taken all three scenarios. Acha, by the way, chalo. Padne, padne, padne se pehle, ebar ye bhi soch. The other three days, my 43 bhi apply nahi kara. Matla. If he has taken a loan from an NDFC which does not take deposits from the public but the asset value is less than 500 crores then this interest will be allowed as a deduction to him but 43 we will not apply to his deduction pay but the pay may be here and the pay here and the pay here and the pay will be the amount of the address and the amount of the amount of the amount
they would have opened it to everyone, then many people would have opened their accounts. But it yeah, we said central government employee gave a benefit there. Yeah. Then the appointment in section 80 CCD, calculation type appointment type. So it will affect your solutions also. In 80 CCD, there is a pension scheme. When the employee contributes, employee contributes, he gets a deduction 80 CCD subsection 1. When the employer contributes, deduction is allowed under 80 CCD subsection 2. And there is another subsection 1B for the own contribution rate. The maximum limit attached there is 50,000. So subsection 1, the account holder's own contribution, maximum 10% of salary. And if you are a non-salary employee, mother, sorry, if you are not an employee, so it is 20% of GPI, non salary, the base taken is GPI. If you are a salaried employee and the employer, employer is also making a contribution, then it is 10% of salary as a maximum limit, contribution made or 10% of salary maximum. This is the amount of deduction that the employee gets for the employer's contribution. Now the amendment is, if you are a central government employee, then the 10% has been increased to 14%. So for all other employees, it still remains 10% only. For a central government employee, when the employer would contribute, that deduction would increase to 14%. This is your ATCCB government. They close up. So it's just a matter of remembering that government employee who are central government contribution, they have the 14% government. All other employees, it is 10% government. Because you already taken a deduction under 24B. 
So even if it is the first home that you have bought and you give it on rate, okay, I stay on rate basis and I buy a first home for myself and I give it on rate. I pay rent, I receive rent. So I'm the owner of my house, I'm the first home buyer, and buying the first home. I may be satisfying every other condition of ETEEA. But if my property is given on rent, the whole interest anyways is allowed as a deduction under 24B. So that interest cannot be again allowed under ETEEA. It's a double deduction. If I'm a first home buyer and I'm satisfying conditions of ETEEA and I'm treating my first home as SOP, so SOP ke section 24B with reference to SOP means that the maximum deduction is 2 lakhs. Now, if 2 lakh rupees is already allowed as a deduction under section 24B, then the same 2 lakhs cannot be allowed as a deduction under ETEEA. But which means, ha, the interest that I would have paid more than 2 lakh rupees, was 24B mein deduction nahi mila. If I satisfy the conditions of ETEEA, so I will get a deduction under that section from gross total income. Samjha? Ek bar section padlo, ATEEA. You will find this on page. Page 20. that is available not only for one year, every year, but then for this deduction, the loan that you have taken should be sanctioned to in the current year 1920. Then the loan will be outstanding in the next year also, there will be interest payable next year also, the deduction will continue next year, but the sanctioned period should be falling between 1st April 19 and 31st March 20. You should not be having any other property, any residential property as of the date of sanction of the loan. That means when you are buying this property, when the, sorry, when the loan is being sanctioned, you don't have any property of your own. That's why I was saying, you are first home, your first home buyer. Maximum deduction is restricted to 150,000. Every year deduction will be allowed subject to a maximum limit of 150,000. And the stamp duty value of the property should not exceed 45 lakhs. Now, this means that if the stamp duty value of the property exceeds 45 lakhs, then this whole section does not apply. Then whatever deduction is allowed to you as per section 24B, that is the maximum deduction available. Anyways, if 24B is talking about LOP or DLOP, ATEEA is not available. If 24B is covering this property as a SOP, then there is a possibility that ATEEA will apply subject to the conditions being fulfilled. Max to max deduction will be 150. 
So combined, I can think like this. Okay, 2 lakh rupees ka maximum deduction for SOP will be allowed under 2014. And 1 lakh 50,000 ka maximum deduction will be allowed under 80 EEA. So on an overall basis, 3 and a half lakh rupees ka deduction will be allowed. Samash Padam? Similarly, the next section is that 80 EEB. If you are buying an electric vehicle, the electric vehicle being Bojo EV bar concept, right? it's not running on petrol, mm -hmm. it's running on those electric batteries. So if you are buying an electric vehicle and for that purpose if you are taking a loan, the interest on that loan is going to be allowed as a deduction to you under 80 EEB. Now if you observe 80 EEB, that is on page number 21, Actually, what I have tried to do is, if you would have observed this also, I have exactly printed the section the way it is there in the Act. Mm -hmm. So, the language may be a bit more technical and therefore a bit more difficult to comprehend. You will have to read it a bit slowly. Like, if I do 80 EEB with you the way it is printed, subsection 1 they go. Deduction is allowed only to individuals. I am reading 80 EEB, that is page number 21. And I am trying to highlight small small points. If you understand what you see, you can highlight those points. Okay, okay. reduction is not allowed to all seven persons. Reduction is allowed only if you are a individual. Deduction maximum amount shall be one lakh fifty thousand. Assessment year twenty twenty one. That is our assessment year and subsequent assessment year. So like one lakh fifty thousand was the limit in EEA. It's the same limit in EEB. <coughs> Loan has been sanctioned between April 2019 and March 2023. March 23 means financial year 2223. That means 1920, 2021, 2122, 2223. This is the year of the loan sanction. Then the interest that you pay every year for this electric vehicle will be allowed as a deduction for you. Where a deduction is allowed under this section, deduction shall not be allowed in respect of such interest under any other provision of this act. Both obvious and double deduction may be there. And as a last thing, things are defined. What do you mean by an electric vehicle? So, technical thing, legal definition may have been electric vehicle concept. You are taking a loan from a financial institution. Financial institution means a banking company, deposit taking NBFC are covered, non deposit taking systemically important NBFCs are covered. Jobnayaj. 43B mm -hmm. They are also covered here. Matlab, if an NBFC gives a loan for electric vehicle, the borrower of that loan, I mean the person who has taken that loan for <coughs> electric vehicle, will get a deduction under this section ATEEB. The only smart thing to discuss with you, see, section is quite straightforward. 150 ka deduction maximum, electric vehicle ke liye hona you are an individual, you get a deduction. Sanction period is for financial years anytime, get a deduction every year from gross total income because the section number is EP -E -E The smart thing to discuss with you would be, do you realize that deduction is allowed only to individual? Mm -hmm. That means deduction is not allowed to a company, deduction is not allowed to a partnership firm. Why? Very simple, there is no need also. I tell you why. A company or a partnership firm will consider that electric vehicle as a business asset. Now the moment it is a business asset, it will form part of block office. Up to the date the electric vehicle is put to use, interest will be added to the cost, actual cost. After that, the interest will be put to p &L account. And there is already a section in Income Tax Act 3613, interest on borrowed capital, which allows a deduction of interest for capital, which is borrowed for business purpose. Mm -hmm. Now, borrowed for business purpose means working capital is fixed asset, or electric vehicle is also electric mm -hmm. vehicle. So, a company and a partnership firm, you don't need ATEEB because there is already. 36.3 in the chapter of PGB. <coughs> and actual cost to add hoi jayega up to the rate asset is put to use. Matha one way or the other, tukko deduction mili raha hai. You are getting a deduction. Achha, using this argument, you can also tell me, okay, sir, that logic will equally apply even if the borrower is an individual. Mm -hmm. I mean, company and firm using electric vehicles for business purpose. Those logic case of say, if an individual is doing business, mm -hmm. business or profession, and is taking a loan for electric vehicle, so even the individual will put it in the block of asset, right? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, if you understand what I'm saying, the discussion that I did with you for company and firm purchasing electric vehicle for business purposes will equally apply if the electric vehicle was purchased by an individual for business purposes. Mm -hmm. Samaj I can generalize. If the electric vehicle is purchased and put to use for business, then whether the OCC is an individual or a company or a partnership firm, business profession ke chapter may you will anyways get the reduction. Correct? So what is section of this section? Because, think about it, 3613 interest on borrowed capital in the chapter of PGBP does not have any maximum limit. It only says bank loan hua, financial institution loan hua, payment basis pe deduction milega. But it does not say 1 lakh, 50,000, 2 lakh, 3 lakh, 5 lakh, koi amount limit nahi hai. The only condition put up for deduction is a payment basis. Now this section 80 EEB has a limit of 1 lakh 50,000. This section 80 EEB is applicable to individuals. But the same individual can take a deduction under the head business profession also. Non-individuals anyways will take their deduction under business profession. If everybody is going to take a deduction under business profession, then why the hell do you need this section? Because the deduction already is fully allowed under business profession. What is the point of this section? The only point for this section is individual purchasing the electric vehicle for personal purposes. Because the moment you say it is for personal purpose, the chapter of PGBP gets ruled out. And then, if the electric vehicle is used by this individual for personal purposes, we are wanting to promote electric vehicle. So how do I promote it? Well, you take a deduction under ATEEB. And I never needed other entities to get promoted. I never needed to promote a company or a firm for electric vehicle because even if they do the transaction, sections are already existing in the income tax act to give them deduction. This deduction individual can be specially easily made that if the electric vehicle is used for personal purpose, then this section will apply. Because if it's used for business purpose, PGBP ke chapter mein, anyways it will get covered. Tumko samjha? Sure? Okay. What is Ajam? Page number 14. So we've done EEA, we've done EEB. Now 139.1, what is 139.1? Yeah. E-amendment important. <coughs> there are two amendments in 139.1. First amendment. Uh, for, for somebody like us, hopefully you remember this provision. For somebody who is not a company, for a company in a firm, filing of return is compulsory. But for all other assessees, filing of return depends on Gross total income. Gross total income without taking your deductions under ATC to ATU, that gross total income should exceed the basic exemption limit. Only then you have to file a return of income. If a gross total income does not exceed the basic exemption limit, the return need not be filed. Define gross total income. Do you include capital gains in it? Which capital gains do you include? I'm giving you an option. I'm not wanting answers as a short term, long term. Name. That's not what I'm thinking. Which capital gain do you include in the gross total income? The one that you have before claiming exemptions or the one that you have after claiming exemptions? Exemption number 54 series one is exemption three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, amen. 54 series one exemption, frankly, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, anybody remembers? <coughs> National Highway Authority of India, Rural Development Bonds, NHI Bonds, 54 EC. 54 EC. Then uh, you sell a house property, you buy another house property. Aaj mm -hmm. discussion kiya. Then you get an exemption under 54. Then you may remember, a court section kiya tha 54F. You sell a long term asset which is not a house property. And you buy an asset which is a house property. On proportionate basis, you have to invest net consideration. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, my question is you will take those exemptions wherever they are. Which capital gain is taxable? The capital gain before these exemptions or after these exemptions? 
तुमने टैक्स रेट तो पढ़ा कैपिटल गेन्स का टैक्स रेट तो इस टैक्स रेट्स विल अप्लाई ऑन व्हिच कैपिटल आफ्टर द एक्सेप्शन द अमाउंट्स व्हिच आर एग्जेम्प्ट उस पे टैक्स भरना ही नहीं है ना तुमको सो व्हिच कैपिटल गेन विल यू इंक्लूड इन ग्रॉस टोटल इनकम एंड आफ्टर इंक्लूडिंग सॉरी आफ्टर टेकिंग द एक्सेप्शन आफ्टर टेकिंग द एक्सेप्शन यू गेट द बैलेंस कैपिटल गेन व्हिच यू टेक इन ग्रॉस टोटल इनकम then you add other incomes mm-hmm. and that is below the basic exemption limit so you will not file a return mm-hmm. correct yes sir the amendment inserted is that for filing of return the gross total income that you will calculate will be without giving effect to those exemptions which will mean we are not telling you to pay tax on capital gains take the exemption But for filing return, you have to check GTI with basic exemption limit. That GTI will include that capital gain, which is before taking the exemption. So moment you don't take exemption, your GTI will increase. So it will go, it can go beyond. Your, it can exceed the basic exemption limit. So return file karo. And once you file a return of income, it will be possible for the assessing officer to verify and check. That have you taken the exemption under capital gains properly or not? Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. For oh, NHI bonds, wala jo tha, that's 54 EC. You have to purchase, invest in the bonds within six months. You took the exemption under 54 EC and did not file a return. Say after the exemption, after taking the exemption, GTI is below exemption. But what if you had not invested in bonds within six months? You had wrongly taken the exemption. Income tax officer will never be able to check this only because you are not filing a return of income. So, when a return of income ka section modify kar diya. But I don't give effect to the exemption and calculate GTI. Now, if that GTI is above the exemption limit, file a return. In the return, you take the exemption. We don't mind. But the moment you file a return, it gives an opportunity to the assessing officer to call you and ask you, "Ki ye jo exemption liya na, iska proof dekha ho." so he can i don't know whether you will remember this from our discussion but maine aapke sath return of income ke chapter mein discussion kiya tha ki there is something called as scrutiny that happens <laughs> but for scrutiny to happen there must be a return of income kis cheez ko scrutiny as karega return ko so i must ensure ke return file ho to maine amendment kya laya bola do not give effect to exemption and then check the gpi If that exceeds the basic exemption limit, to file the return. Return I got, so I can do scrutiny, na? Ye samajh pada? And the second amendment is, suppose your gross total income is below the basic exemption limit, below the basic exemption limit. So logically, you are not supposed to file a return. But certain transactions are specifically highlighted and included in 139.1. If your electricity expenses in the year. Exceed one lakh rupees. Electricity expenses. It is not mentioned that the electricity expenses are personal electricity expense or business electricity expense. Nothing like that. If the electricity expense that you incur in the year, the bill of electricity that you pay in the year exceeds one lakh. If the foreign travel expenses that you incur, traveling to foreign countries, the expense that you incur during the year exceeds two lakh rupees. And there was one more amendment here. Ha! If the amount of cash that you deposit in the bank, in a current account in the bank, exceeds one crore rupees, then even if your gross total income is below the basic exemption limit, you will still have to file a return. A prima facie section sounds very illogical. Well, electricity expense one lakh crores, foreign travel expense two lakh crores, so to be return file karo. Reason. Very sensible reason. Prima facie, it sounds very nonsense. It is possible that my taxable income, taxable sources, five heads of income, they are less than basic exemption limit. But I earn exempt incomes from which I pay electricity bills, or from which I incur foreign travel expenses, or those exempt incomes I deposit as cash in a bank account, and. Exempt income is another part of GTI. So <coughs> GTI includes taxable amount, which is below basic exemption limit. Right? Five years of income taxable. But what if I have agricultural income? What if I have dividend income, which are all exempted from tax? 
Section 10 may exempt it. But using that exempt income, I can spend electricity expenses and foreign travel expenses. Ye ek version. Second version that is possible is the guy could be showing less as white and more as black mm -hmm. and spending electricity and foreign travel from the black expense, mm -hmm. from the black money that he has. Mm -hmm. So officially he is showing gross total income, white income. But he is taking a majority of his income in black and spending that black income. The black amount is anyways not included in GDI. Mm -hmm. Now my white income is below the basic exemption, so I will not do it. So we inserted a section which said if these criteria happen, electricity expense above 1 lakh, foreign travel expense above 2 lakh, <coughs> then even if you, your GTI is below exemption limit, you will have to file a return. Now the moment he files a return, moment he see a final level method, content you need not remember, understand the law, the moment he files a return, even if his GTI is below exemption limit, we will ask him, electricity expense kitna kiya? Electricity expense 3 lakh rupiah kiya. So the gross total income is 1 lakh 75,000. So 3 lakh electricity pay kitar se kiya. Now if he's a genuine guy who has exempt incomes, so he'll be able to prove. Okay, look, this bank account made dividend aya tha ye company ka, dividend aya tha mutual fund ka, agriculture income aya tha, partnership out ke share of profit aya tha, aur usko se electricity pay kiya tha. So he'll prove ho ke, genuine bata hai. Otherwise he'll not be able to prove. If he's not able to prove, so that's the way we've got it. Matlab, tera itna to income hai na? The fact that you have spent the money means there was itna paisa aya tha. Matlab, tera income hai. To prove karke dikha, ye kaan se karcha hai tha. Ab to prove nahi karta, to mein tera income maan ke tax kar dita ho. Samaj paada? Yes, sir. Pad do ye do sections. I mean, two amendments, one thirteen and one nahi hai sab kuch. Par mainne saath mein example bhi dikha hai. Zara fara 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 fara.
you have to mandatorily quote or give your permanent account number. Like you open a bank account, you have to give your permanent account number. You purchase a property, you have to give your permanent account number. At various, various financial transactions, it is mandatory to submit your permanent account number. Now, we are trying to connect the two, permanent account number and other number. So this, this amendment is that somebody who has not been allotted a permanent account number but has been allotted an other number, wherever he has to sub quote or submit his permanent account number, he can submit his other number in replacement of permanent account number. This is a this is an alternate method. This is mentioned in the section. So examination perspective, you can have a theory question based on it. And that's the only reason I'm discussing it. Baki, you'll understand ki bhai, uh, is amendment may as such could come ahead. The only thing is that places where you have to give your PAN, you can give your Aadhaar number. If someone has not been allotted a permanent account number but has been allotted an Aadhaar number, then the department will take steps that such a person should be allotted a permanent account. Theory has but Lena, theory question as a driver. Now, page 70. These are four sections related to PDS amendments. When life insurance policy amount is received, the amount is exempt. But certain cases the amount is taxable. And if the amount is taxable, then the TTS rate is 1%. Like Keyman insurance policy, if you remember. Mm -hmm. It's a life insurance policy, but the amount received is taxable. So for the receiver, it is taxable. That means when the insurance company would pay the money, that's the payer. Insurance company would do TTS. The rate of TDS that was prescribed was 1% and the amount was the LIC amount, the, the sum assured. But over a period of time, there have been various judgments where which those judgments have highlighted the fact that you must pay income tax not on the full amount of sum assured but only on the profit element that is involved in it. Profit element matlab. Okay, I have paid life insurance premium, that's an expense. And at the end, I'm getting the sum assured. When I premium pay kya, see the policy lasted for 10 years, and every year I was paying a premium of 97,000. So 9,70,000 ka mera expenditure hai. And from that policy, 10 years later, I'm getting 25 lakh rupees. So 25 lakh minus 9,70, this difference should be taxable. This is the crux of many judgments. Courts have held that pura 25 lakh taxable nahi hona chahiye. 25 lakh minus the premium paid, only the surplus should be taxable. Which means, um, what the government did was, ye concept ko TDS pe incorporate kar liya. Well, TDS earlier used to be done on the sum assured, but that was a payment made. LIC pura 25 lakhs pay karta tha. So it had to do TDS on the full 25 lakhs. Now what will it do? LIC will take the sum assured minus the premiums pay, find out the profit element and do TDS on the profit element only, not on the full sum assured. And the second amendment was that your rate of TDS is increased from 1% to 5%. Matab, the old law was 1% of sum assured. TDS was very simple. Now you are decreasing the base you are saying sum assured pay TDS mat karo, sum assured minus the premium. So <coughs> sum plus profit hai, us pay TDS karo. So rate increase kar diya. Bola 25 lakh pay 1% mat karo, 25 lakh minus, meri example hai, 9 lakh 70 ka premium, jo difference hai, us pay 5% karo. This is the TDS amendment relating to life insurance policies. Then there was another section of TDS where when you are doing a transaction in properties, immovable properties. The buyer of the property would be paying the consideration and he would be doing TDS. The rate of TDS was 1%. If the consideration amount exceeded 50 lakh rupees. Amendment is pretty understandable and quite easy also. Well, if, if let's say I buy a flat from you, you are the seller, I am the buyer. For you it is the head capital gains. For me I am buying the flat. I am paying 75 lakh rupees to you. 
then I was supposed to do KDS at 1% of 75 lakhs. Pretty simple. But the problem was, the section said 1% of the consideration. But consideration defined the thing. <coughs> Nowadays when you purchase property, you don't only pay money for the flat. Nee, stamp duty. Nee. To the builder itself, stamp duty to state government ko jata hai. To the builder itself, you pay various other charges. Parking charges pay hota hai. If the building, if the property has a club, to club ka membership bhi pay hota hai. Many times you pay maintenance of the property in advance when you are buying the flat. Bola, you are buying the flat, one year ka maintenance, the monthly maintenance that you have, you pay in advance. Now, all this is paid to the builder. But consideration was not defined. So what people used to do was, flat ke cost ka 1% karke TDS was done. Only flat cost. That means if the flat costed me 75 lakhs, parking ka I paid another 10 lakhs, club ka membership fee I paid 5 lakhs, maintenance etc I paid 3 lakh rupees. Technically I am paying 75 lakh plus 10 lakh parking plus 5 lakh club membership plus 3 lakh advance payment. But TDS was done only on the flat cost because the word consideration was not defined only. Now they have defined consideration. Consideration will include all of this. But now you do TDS on the entire thing. If, if this consideration was not defined now, the, the problem that could happen is you may initially feel that it's okay, right? First 75 lakhs per 1% was done. Now it's total per 1% was done. What was the impact of the amendment? No, the impact was done. And let's explain how. What if the flat cost is below 50 lakhs? But flat cost plus all these expenses put together exceeds 50 lakhs. Now the section of the threshold limit is 50 lakh rupees. I bought a flat for 40 lakhs. Parking 10 lakh, club membership 5 lakh, who advance maintenance 3 lakh, total 50 lakh cross ho gaya. Now the confusion will be, should I do TDS or not? Because flat ka cost 50 lakh se kam hai. But overall 50 lakh se jada hai. Samaj bada toko? Hence the need to define this term. Kibar consideration ka matlab kya hai? Consideration includes both. Ye toh cheese pato zara 194 BA and 194 IA. For the builder, yes, because it will be all part of his sales. So for tax liability purposes, for the receiver, everything will be done. Yes. Okay. Now I want you to come to page number twenty-two. Section of works contract. 
when you do TDS under 194C, it's a works contract payment. You may not remember it right now, no problem, just understand I do things a bit more in detail, but afresh. 194H is the section where you do TDS on commission. And 194J is where you do TDS on professional fees, technical fees, royalty. Now there is something common in all these three sections. They go. 194C works contract. 194H commission. And 194J professional fees, technical fees, and royalty. There are two things which are common in all three sections. First common thing. If the payment is made for personal purposes, then these sections are not applicable. Not applicable. So, if I buy a house property for my personal usage and I pay commission to someone, TDS does not apply. If I give a work contract to someone but it's not for business but for my personal purposes, works contract does not apply. If I'm paying professional fees to someone for my personal work, not business work, personal work, then TDS ka section apply nahi hota. Second common thing. If the payer is an individual or HUF, then TDS under those three sections will apply in the current year. If my turnover and gross receipts in the preceding year, preceding financial year, they exceed the monetary limits that are prescribed under section 44AB. 44AB is the section of tax audit. And tax audit ka section says, that for business, the limit is greater than 1 crore and for a profession, the limit is greater than 50 years. It's a if wala situation. That means 194C payment, 194H, 194J. If the payer is a company partnership form, the section will always apply. But if the payer is an individual or an HUF, and last financial year, if my turnover or gross receipts exceeded those monetary limits of 1 crore, then the current financial year, when I'm making a payment of commission or works contract, I'm supposed to do TDS. That means in simple terms, individual HUF in the current year, TDS section depends on the condition that you have to satisfy last year. Last year, cut turnover should exceed a particular limit. Current year, company and firm will always do TDS. Individual HF in the current year will do TDS only if in the preceding year those limits exceeded. This is what the section is. Now government, this has been since since a long time. In fact, from the time this section were drafted, this provision is Government now feels that because of this aspect, the personal purpose over to these sections are not applicable. If the monetary limits are lesser, sorry, monetary limits, if the turnover is lesser than monetary limits. Last year, my professional fees were less than 50 lakhs. So current year, when I make a payment as an individual, TDS ka section apply nahi hoga. So much The government feels that there are so many transactions like this, which are escaping TDS, because either they are for personal purpose, or last year cut turnover did not cross the monetary limit. So current year to TDS is not Up to target this section 194N is created. For the transactions which are not covered by 194C, 194H, 194J, due to any reason they are not covered by those three sections. So they will be covered by 194N. Ha, the only thing to clarify, works contract is applicable. Commission is applicable. 
but 194J may say professional fees are covered in 194M, not everything else. So in 194M, three payments are covered. Works contract, commission, only professional fees, royalty and technical fees are not covered. 194L will apply if and only if 194C, 194H, 194J are not available. That's another thing that goes without saying. 194M will apply to individual HUF only. Because companies and firms are not applicable to those sections. So TDS 194C, H and J are not available. Do you understand this? Threshold limit created here is greater than 50 lakh rupees. If the payment made exceeds 50 lakhs, then this will be a section of the law. And if my memory goes correct, the TDS rate is some 5% or 10%. Exactly, yeah. Look at the technician file or so. What is the technician file here? 5% only. Yeah, it's not a So three payments are covered, works contract, or, uh, sorry, professional fees and commission. Tax will be deducted at the rate of 5%. This subsection 1 may be And then in paragraph 1, I will provided that no such deduction, which means TDS will not be done, <coughs> if the amount of sum that is paid to a resident during a financial year does not exceed 50 lakh rupees. But the TDS will be done only if it exceeds 50 lakhs. Otherwise, TDS will not be done. And the rate of TDS will be 5%. So, exactly speaking, who will be covered here? If I am talking about an individual or an HUF, who is making a payment in the current year for personal purposes? Who is making a payment in the current year of works contract, commission, or professional fees, but for personal purposes? So those three sections are not applicable. 194M will apply. Or, even if he is making a payment in the current year for business purposes, not personal, business, but last year Kauska turnover was less than 1 crore, less than 50 lakhs. So 194C, 194H and 194J do not apply. So 194M will apply. Situation is much better. I'll do this, I'll draw this in a bit systematic manner, so I'm going to copy it. But conceptually, are you clear with it? Yes, sir. And 194N, the next section that is created. This is quite frankly a very stupid section. Quite frankly, this is a very stupid section. This section is saying that in a financial year, if you withdraw cash, in excess of 1 crore rupees then from a bank account then that excess amount that you are withdrawing whose bank is supposed to do 2% ka TDS when you read the explanation given by the government in the, in the memorandum it says to discourage cash payments ye TDS ka section hai, that you already have bank balance you withdraw cash and in the current year, the total amount of cash withdrawn exceeds 1 crore. So, 1 crore ke upar jitna withdraw kiya, us excess pay 2% ke sab se bank will do TDS. Now, why is this section a stupid section? It is stupid because the money that is deposited in the bank account, analyze what will that be. Think about it. I have a bank balance of 3 crores. I withdraw 2.5 crores from that bank account cash. So, section ke hisab se 2.5 crore minus 1 crore difference amount pe 2% ke hisab se TDS ho It's TDS done by bank. So, it is in my name when I file my return of income. From my tax payable, mein wo TDS minus karo. Kis cheez pe TDS hoa? Cash withdrawal. Now, common sense. TDS is done on income and expense. So, cash withdrawal pe TDS laga rahe ho. Intention kya hai? Wala cash withdrawal discourage karna hai. But imagine that the bank balance is 3 crore. What will happen? What will be the breakup of that? Or what will be the components of that 3 crore? It could be my exempt incomes. It could be my taxable incomes. Not only of the current year, but it could be of the past year also. It could be that I have a fixed deposit or debenture mature. And it has been done with the proceeds. 
लॉजिकली एग्जेक्ट इनकम पे टैक्स लगना नहीं चाहिए टैक्सेबल इनकम इज ऑलरेडी टैक्स इनकम और उस पर तुम टीडीएस तो इनकम ऑलरेडी टैक्सेबल है मैं टैक्स भर चुका हूँ लास्ट ईयर और वो बैंक बैलेंस में है और मैं कैश विड्रॉ कर रहा हूँ उस पर टीडीएस होगा और वो टीडीएस आई विल बी एबल टू रिड्यूस फ्रॉम माई टैक्स पेबल ऑल्सो अनदर रिड्यूबल थिंग दैट यू कैन अंडरस्टैंड इज टैक्स पेबल विल बी ऑन इनकम एंड टीडीएस विल बी ऑन कैश विड्रॉ मतलब कनेक्टिविटी के नाम पर कुछ है ही नहीं मेरे ग्रॉस टोटल इनकम माइनस एटीसी टू एटी वो टोटल इनकम पे टैक्स कैलकुलेट किया तो मैं स्लैब रेट एक्सेट्रा अप्लाई करके फिर उसमें से टीडीएस माइनस किया किस चीज का वो टीडीएस इज नॉट ऑफ द जीटीएल टीडीएस इज ऑन कैश फ्रॉम डेबिट टू बैंक वॉलेट ये समझ पड़ा एंड अ वेरी इजी वे टू डिफीट दिस सेक्शन वेरी इजी वे टू डिफीट दिस सेक्शन देखो हु इज सपोज टू डू टीडीएस बैंक इज सपोज टू डू टीडीएस इफ यू रीड द सेक्शन इट सेस एवरी पर्सन हु इज अ बैंकिंग कंपनी और अ कोऑपरेटिव सोसाइटी एंगेज इन द बिजनेस ऑफ बैंकिंग मतलब अ कोऑपरेटिव बैंक For a post office, if they are responsible for paying any sum or aggregate of sums in cash in excess of one crore during the previous year to any person from one or more accounts maintained by the recipient, shall deduct tax at the rate of two percent. मतलब TDS would be done by bank if the account holder is receiving cash by withdrawing it from the bank, okay? and the threshold limit is one crore. मेरे पास bank balance तीन करोड़ रुपया था. तीन करोड़ रुपए था मैं क्या करता है चार बैंक अकाउंट खोलता हूँ पहले वो तीन करोड़ रुपए चार बैंक अकाउंट में स्प्रेड कर दो और फिर हर बैंक अकाउंट से कैश विड्रॉ करो अमाउंट लेस देन वन करो क्या टी डी एस हुआ तो सेक्शन बनाया इन अ मिनट आई वॉज एबल टू डी एंड डी यू रिलेक्स मैंने कैश विड्रॉ कर लिया पूरा मोर देन वन करो बट टी डी एस इज ऑलवेज दम पेयर रिसीवर के बीच में चार अलग अलग बैंक मतलब चार पेयर बन गए हर बैंक में से सेवेंटी फाइव लैक्स विड्रॉ किया तो पूरा तीन करोड़ मेरे घर पे कैश आ गया विदाउट इवन सिंगल रुपए ऑफ टी तो क्या तीन मार लिया सेक्शन बना के यू अंडरस्टूड हाउ आई इंटरप्रेटेड द सेक्शन आई यू क्लियर ओके ये चीज लिखना है तो आई शेड फाइन इट लिख रहा हूँ बिकॉज नेक्स्ट फॉर द लास्ट थिंग दैट वी नीड टू डो आई नीड द बोर्ड एफ टी ये चीज लिख रहा हूँ तो लिख रहा हूँ
कैसे कैलकुलेट करोगे स्लैब रेट कम फॉर्म हुआ तो फ्लैट रेट कैपिटल गेन कैजुअल विनिंग्स डिविडेंड इनकम आया तो स्पेशल रेट्स ये एक अमाउंट आया do not include surcharge do not include education sales right now just calculate the basic amount if my regular tax is less then the alternate minimum tax calculated on adjusted total income or the adjusted total income first important thing is the meaning of the term adjusted total income ye ye kya hai you start with total income you add back deduction that you have claimed under 35 ed 35 ed is your capital expenditure on that specified business while you were calculating gti please dhyan dena is pe ye kaun sa complicated hai while you were calculating gti under the head business profession you would have taken 35 ed ka deduction now you are starting with total income and adding back that deduction so temporarily you are calculating total income which is adjusted it's an adjusted total to me kya kar raha hu i'm calculating this total income and i'm nullifying the effect nullifying the effect of that 35 ed deduction second thing i will add section 10 a ka deduction <coughs> What is section 10 double A deduction? If you are a unit in a special economic zone (SEZ), then जितना भी profit कमाते हो तो for a span of 15 years you get a deduction. It's not an exemption. Section 10 नहीं है, 10 double A है. Like you have 80 C to 80 US deduction, you have section 10 double A also as a deduction. So while you were calculating total income. तुमने टेन डबल ए का डिडक्शन लिया आई डो मैन्युफैक्चरिंग इन अ स्पेशल इकोनॉमिक जोन मैन्युफैक्चरिंग दैट इज डन देयर इज एक्सपोर्टेड जितना एक्सपोर्ट हुआ उसके प्रोपोर्शन में प्रॉफिट कैलकुलेट करो एंड दैट प्रॉफिट इज अलाउड एज अ डिडक्शन यू गेट अ डिडक्शन ओनली फॉर फिफ्टीन ईयर्स सिक्सटीन ईयर ऑनवर्ड्स दैट प्रॉफिट विल बी ट्रेटेड लाइक नॉर्मल प्रॉफिट एंड टैक्सीबल डिडक्शन इज अवेलेबल ओनली फॉर फिफ्टीन ईयर्स तुम्हारी टेक्सट बुक में जो चैप्टर नंबर फोर है एग्जाम टेन कब्स वाला चैप्टर उसके एंड में ये सेक्शन टेन डबल ए प्रिंटेड है एंड इफ यू डोंट फाइंड दैट सेक्शन तो लेट मी नो मैं तुमको वो थियरी दे दूंगा पूरा बट नाइनटी नाइन परसेंट एज फार एज माई मेमोरी गोज ये सेक्शन टेक्सट बुक में प्रिंटेड है तो वॉट एवर डिडक्शन यू हैव ऑलरेडी टेकन अंडर टेन डबल ए दैट यू ऑलरेडी टेकन एंड यू कैलकुलेटेड टोटल इनकम अब उस उस डिडक्शन को भी एड बैक करो You take a 35 ED deduction, तुमने वो deduction add back कर दिया। Do depreciation under section 32 on that particular fixed asset which was covered under section 35 ED. 35 ED में capital expenditure is given a 100 percent deduction, समझ गया? But then that fixed asset, वो deduction तुमने add back कर दिया। you made it, you nullified the deduction but for fixed asset in the current year business may use the OI hai. so assuming assuming to us ko block mein dala hota to kitna depreciation karte you calculate that depreciation and you reduce it and you add back deduction under section 80c to 80u in respect of incomes this is the reason why this is originally a CA final concept because what you have studied here ATC to ATO जो तुमने इंटर CA में पढ़ा है ना those are deduction in respect of expenses life insurance being premium PPF contributions contribution to pension scheme medical insurance premium donations made outflows का deduction है at the CA final level you will study कि इफ यू ऑन अ पर्टिकुलर टाइप ऑफ इनकम तो वो इनकम का डिडक्शन मिलता है तुमको एग्जेपन नहीं डिडक्शन मिलता है आई गिव यू डेमो एग्जाम्पल सिलेबस में नहीं है लेकिन समझने के लिए इफ यू सेटअप अ मैन्युफैक्चरिंग यूनिट इन जम्मू एंड कश्मीर 
profit from that unit will be eligible for deduction. Because the moment you do manufacturing in Jammu and Kashmir, that state will get developed. So, we have encouragement to say 10 years of your profit deduction. Set up a factory there, manufacture it there, mass goods produce it there, sell it there. Jo bhi profit hai na, we will not take tax for 10 years. We will give you a deduction. Profit likho GTI gross total income mein, business profession ke chapter mein profit include kar do. Aur profit hi haan pe minus kar do, don't pay tax on it. Deduction 10 saal. 11th year, you start taking deduction, you start paying tax. Ab ye CA final syllabus hai, there are various conditions attached. That is why this whole concept is CA final. At the inter level, ye deduction in respect of incomes, there are three things covered. A. Section 80 double J double A. This section is if you create new jobs. So mm -hmm. workers ko job diya, to 80 double J double A mein deduction hai. Second is section 80 Q Q B, which is talking about royalty income if you are an author. And the third section is ATRRB, which talks about royalty income in case of patents. Now, you see, section 80 is the deduction and income is related. Royalty is not paid for the royalty, it is received for the author. So, the income will be included here and you will take a deduction. Now, you are starting with that total income, this figure. And you are adding back these deductions. अब ये जो आंसर आए ना आपका, this is your adjusted total income. और ये adjusted total income पे calculate 18.5 percent. And that amount you compare with your regular tax. If regular tax is less than this tax, then for that particular previous year, you will say total income this means my adjusted total and tax payable will be equal to the alternate minimum tax even a figure plus surcharge plus health education says 4 percent even a tax payable in very simple terms a first method a regular method a normal method ये सेकेंड मेथड, ये ऑल्टरनेट मेथड, बट मिनिमम 18.5 परसेंट तो भरना पड़ेगा। एग्जाम्पल लो, समझो कि फॉर प्रीवियस ईयर 1920 मेरा रेगुलर टैक्स इस 4 लाख 10,000 एंड माय ऑल्टरनेट मिनिमम टैक्स इस 4 लाख 35,000 Blindly section apply karo and you will understand my kya pooch raho. What will I pay to the government? 410 or 435? 435. Suppose I tell you ki ye 410 nahi hai, ye 510 hai and this is 435. Now what will I pay to the government? Is regular less than AMD? No. So will I pay AMD? Will I pay tax? Yes. Then I won't pay the alternate color tax. Then I'll pay the regular tax. Matlab, koi bachcha ye samaj sakta hai. Regular or AMT bhi chal rahi sakta hai. Yaha tak samjha? Come to this example and explain something to me. Regular kitna? 4.5. AMT kitna? 4.5. Main kitna baro? 4.5. अब मेरा प्रॉब्लम साला मैं एक्स्ट्रा क्यों भरूं? You announce the budget, you give me all these rates as per the budget, as per income tax act. उसके हिसाब से four lakh ten आया. Now you are introducing a wild card. बोला मैं ये four thirty five भरूं क्यों? ये alternate में भरूं. ये तो unfair है. तो government बोलता है ठीक है unfair है तो एक काम करो. We will calculate something called as AMT credit. <coughs> Mathematical hai, nothing great. So, we will do it. 
AMT credit will apply if your regular tax is less than AMT. Then AMT credit is equal to the amount of AMT minus the amount of regular tax. मतलब ये 25,000 रुपए आ रहे हैं तुम्हारा, ये तुम्हारा AMT credit है। This is तो तो मतलब इसी extra tax है टाइप में। ऐसा क्यों किया? Because government बोलता है कि ये AMT credit will be carried forward for a span of 15 years. अब when you carry forward something, तो future में उसका क्या करते हो? तो ये AMT credit भी set off होगा। कब सेट ऑफ होगा? If your regular tax is greater than AMT किसी पर्टिकुलर ईयर में तो सेट ऑफ विल बी अलाउड। सेट ऑफ कैलकुलेट कैसे होगा? बोला फाइंड आउट द रेगुलर टैक्स माइनस AMT फॉर दैट ईयर। कंपेयर इट विथ द AMT क्रेडिट दैट इज अवेलेबल फॉर दैट ईयर। आउट ऑफ द टू विच अवर इज लोअर is the amount of set off. Numbers में समझो सब कुछ। ये तो समझता है ये AMT credit है। Previous year 2021 five lakh thirty thousand, five lakh sixty thousand। बोल, what do I pay? Five sixty का AMT। अब तो I pay extra thirty और ये extra thirty मेरा credit है जो carry forward होगा। 21-22 regular tax 6,10,000 AMT is 5,80,000 5,85,000 now is regular less than AMT or more than AMT? but for that year what am I supposed to pay? 6,10,000 6,10,000 तो अब मेरा प्रीवियस ईयर 2122 का वर्किंग दिखेगा बोला टैक्स पेबल इज सिक्स टेन अब ऐसे ही बोलेगा कि यार बीच में इज हायर के रोल के हिसाब से आए तो ऑलवेज पे मोर आई एम ऑलवेज पे का हायर अमाउंट बट देन अनाव ऐसे ही भी लाती है विद द गवर्नमेंट मैंने तेरे को 55,000 एक्स्ट्रा दे दिया ऑलरेडी अब वो सेट ऑफ कर गवर्नमेंट बोलता है कर सेट ऑफ but even after the set off, मुझको minimum amount of tax तो मिलना होता है। This formula will ensure that minus the set off formula apply करो। Regular tax six ten minus five lakh eighty five give me the difference। Check check twenty five आता है। ठीक है। Five seventy का करो। Fifty five। तो ये थर्टी फाइव थाउजेंड आया। Now, what is the AMT credit available? Out of the two which ever is lower, thirty five minus होगा और ये जो balance बचा five seventy five ये मेरा tax payable होगा। एक मिनट। What this means is, what is the credit available with me? If I adjust the full fifty five. So my payable amount falls below the minimum amount. Which doesn't go to the government, the minimum should be. So the government says, Rona, why are you paying 55,000 more? Now we can pay less. But even after adjusting that credit, I get the minimum tax. Do you understand this? Okay, so explain something. Here, what is the AMT credit that I will still carry forward? 55 था मैं, 35 सेट ऑफ हो गया, 20 कैरी फॉर होगा। अब समझो, 22, 23, my tax payable is four lakh thirty thousand as per regular, and as per AMT it is four lakh. Is regular greater than AMT? Yes. तो ये will I do some set off? Yes. Now for previous year, 22, 23. My tax payable will be 4,30,000 minus the amount of set-off. Formula ke isaf se, regular minus a ka karo. Regular minus EMT, that difference will be 40,000. 
but the credit available with me is only 20. So I will set off 20. 430 में से 20 set off करके I will pay 4 lakh 10, which is still more than the minimum tax. If you then understood this, government ने मुझसे minimum tax लिया. That means I paid extra. वो extra मेरे को carry forward करने दिया. And बोला in a future year, when you don't have to pay AMT, you pay regular. We understand you paid something extra earlier. उसको adjust कर लें. Numerically, ये समझ गया? Last thing to do. ये सब apply कब होगा? This will apply to all persons who are not companies. तो condition number one, it will apply to a partnership account, integrated, HUF, AOP or BOI and artificial juridical person only if deduction under section 35AD or 10AA or deduction in respect of income have been claimed. मतलब एक ऐसे इंडिविजुअल या एक ऐसे फॉर्म का एग्जांपल इमेजिन करो, विच डस नॉट डू एनी स्पेसिफाइड बिजनेस, डस नॉट डू इट, विच इज नॉट ऑपरेटिंग इन एनी स्पेशल इकोनॉमिक जोन आल्सो, एंड विच इज नॉट हैविंग दिस डिडक्शन आल्सो। मतलब एक इंडिविजुअल है मेरे जैसा इंडिविजुअल समझो, जो किसी मैं कोई ऑथर ऑथर नहीं कोई रॉयल्टी इनकम नहीं करता। I just pay life insurance premium and I take my deduction। I'm a normal case। Then this chapter only will not apply to me। This chapter does not apply to companies। ये तो सबको समझता है। तो अदर दर कंपनीज भी बड़ी स्कवर। But condition number one कि they should have taken any one of these three deductions। तो ही ये चैप्टर अप्लाई। Condition number two is applicable। so, all persons, other than companies, obviously because companies is not covered here, and other than partnership form, and the adjusted total income should exceed 20 lakhs. But this is smart. Then you want to take a photo and that will be the end. The whole theory is written. Look, for this chapter to apply, this is condition 1 and condition 2. Condition 1 applies to everybody other than company. Hmm. But condition 2 <laughs> applies to everybody other than company other and company. other than partnership form. But logically, partnership form ke liye, can this is condition 1 apply to. If this chapter has to apply to a partnership form, it just needs to satisfy condition number 1. And what is the condition number 1? It should have taken any one of these deductions. If this chapter has to apply to people like us individuals, we should have taken one of these deductions also. And our adjusted total income year figure should be greater than. Matlab, if I am an individual, you are an individual, you are in a special economic zone, and I do a specified business. Individual, individual, special economic zone, specified, specified business. Both of us satisfy condition one. Yes. But your adjusted total income, ye figure is 27 lakhs. Mm -hmm. And my adjusted total income is 7 lakhs. Mm -hmm. So for you, mm -hmm. this chapter is applicable. Mm -hmm. You will do two calculations. Yes. Regular B and AMD. Yeah. For me, Regular. This chapter is not applicable, yeah. AMD does not apply, I will only be doing regular calculation and take tax. Yes. Frankly, so much better. You sure? Little to more photos.